I'm actually really glad he led that last song, Give Me the Bible, because tonight we're looking, as we conclude our series of lessons on Islam, differences between the Quran, the holy book of Islam, and the Bible, the holy book of Christianity. And one thing we have seen over the past six weeks is that both of these books cannot both be inspired. There's no way that they're both inspired. Same way with the two religions, Islam and Christianity. They both can't be inspired. They both can't be the way to God. We have seen all the contradictions, or we've seen contradictions in the Quran. We've seen what it teaches about uh, a number of issues from the creation. We talked about last Sunday. We've talked about uh, sin and, and a m number of issues tonight. We're going to look at some very, very important teachings that are different between the Quran and the Bible, which again will show uh, definitively that both of them cannot be true. We're going to start tonight with eternal judgment. Eternal judgment. And I'll be quoting from the, or, or referencing the particular chapter, chapters or surahs that they come from in the Quran. As far as Islam is concerned, Islam believes in seven heavens. This comes from Surah 2 and 23. And they believe in paradise, which from the writings apparently is somewhere among the seven heavens. It's a little hard to tell for sure exactly where paradise is for them, but apparently it's among somewhere these seven different heavens. Also, Islam believes that heaven is to be filled with worldly or carnal physical pleasures. This is from 76. These include men having access to beautiful versions. This is in uh, 56, uh, Surah 56. One of the most important points about Islam and about the Quran, when you start going through the Quran, you will see that a large percentage of the Quran is about hell. And descriptions of hell, who's going to be in hell, what's going to happen in hell, a large, large percentage of the Quran deals with hell. Um, it teaches that hell is certainly a real place. It's a place with blazing fire. It's a place with boiling hot water. This is from 40 and from 73. People in hell are forced to eat things uh, very undesirable. They're forced to drink things they don't desire. This is from 38 and 78. Uh, and again, you could spend the entire time talking about what the Quran teaches on hell because it is one of the, the subjects that's most covered and most mentioned in the Quran. Christianity describes three heavens. There's the heaven that the birds fly in. Jesus talked about this in Luke 13, verse 19, where the birds fly, where, where airplanes fly, there's the heaven that's outer space, where the planets are, the stars are, and so forth. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 19 mentions this particular heaven. And then there is heaven where God dwells. Please turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 26, and we'll read verse 15. Deuteronomy 26 verse 15. Look down from your holy habitation, from heaven, and bless your people Israel and the land which you have given us, just as you swore to our fathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. God's holy habitation is called heaven. And the prayer is that he would look down, God would, from heaven. Paradise in the New Testament is also discussed. Paradise is used almost exclusively in the New Testament to refer to the section of the Hadean realm where righteous spirits await the Lord's return. In the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16, note what it says there. Luke 16, verse 22. 
rich man and Lazarus. Verse 22, it says, So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and being in torments in Hades, see, that was the particular part of Hades where he found himself, in torments. So the beggar was in Abraham's bosom. That was the paradise, we might say, part of the realm. Down in verse 25, But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you were tormented. And he goes on and says that there's a great gulf fixed between the two. So in that world, the place righteous spirits go and unrighteous spirits go after death has two compartments. One where you're comforted, one where you are tormented. And remember what Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, he wasn't going to heaven. He was going to paradise. But this world, the Hadean world, uh, the world where these righteous and unrighteous spirits dwell between the time they die and the end of the world, judgment day, is going to be terminated. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 20 that that world will be Gone. Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse 13, says, The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Of course, the Hadean world will be terminated because there's no use for it anymore. It was a temporary place. Now they're going to be in a permanent place. So there's no need for that Hadean world. So, the world of Hades will be terminated. Heaven is not described in great detail in the Bible. But when you look at Revelation chapters 21 and 22, you get some ideas of how wonderful it will be. There's no darkness there because God is there and He's light. There's no need for lights or the sun or anything else or stars because He's there. Uh, there's the tree of life. Uh, there's the, uh, the, uh, the gates where all within are safe and comforted. And the Bible says there's no tears there and there's no death and there's no pain. So there are glimpses given of heaven, but that's all. That's all that's given in Revelation 21 and 22. The Bible says hell is a place where the fire is never quenched. In other words, it never goes out. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus himself said this about hell. And we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about hell tonight because we are on Sunday morning. Mark chapter 9, verses 43 and 44 says, <clears throat> If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. Shall never be quenched. Where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Never goes out. It is a place of everlasting punishment. In other words, a place where punishment does not stop. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Jesus says, Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. There you see two things. It's everlasting. In other words, hell lasts just as long as heaven. The same uh, adjective that describes how long uh, hell lasts describes how long heaven lasts. The exact same word. So heaven lasts as long as hell. How long does heaven last? Forever. Oh, how long does hell last? Forever. And that passage also says that hell was prepared. It's a prepared place. It was prepared for Satan, the devil, and his angels. Jesus also says it's a place of outer darkness. Those are a few of the descriptions that Jesus gives us about what hell is like.
And by that I mean what hell is like that we can understand. Just like only glimpses are given of heaven, well, only glimpses are given of hell. Because it's a place that, that we fully can't comprehend and understand. We do know heaven is a place where we're going to be in God's presence forever. Hell is a place where you'll never be in God's presence. Nor will there ever be any hope of being in God's presence. So very, very big differences between Islam's heaven and hell and Christianity's, the Bible's heaven and hell. Also, there is a great deal of difference in marriage between what the Bible teaches and what the Quran teaches. In the Quran, Surah 4 and 23 says that men may have up to four wives at a time. They don't have to have four wives. They may have four wives. In other words, you could have one, two, three, or four at a time. So polygamy is certainly allowed uh, for men in uh, Islamic countries. Uh, divorce. Uh, a man can divorce his wife in Islam for any reason whatsoever. Uh, makes no difference. Uh, women... Of course, you've seen this on TV and read about it, but women have very little uh, place in, in Islam. They're pretty much a, a second or a third-hand creature. And that's very sad, but it's true. So a man can have up to four wives. Now, uh, Muhammad had many more than that, but... That's what men are supposed to have, no more than four. And he can divorce them for any reason whatsoever. And you've seen, I know lately, some horror stories on TV about uh, women being uh, put to death in Islamic countries for no reason whatsoever. So men have that right in Islamic countries. What does Christianity teach about marriage? Well, vastly, vastly different. The Bible goes all the way back to the beginning and talks about marriage and what it's supposed to be like. It is a union of two people. In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus describes this when he says, beginning in verse 4, After the Pharisees asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Jesus answers and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. So God's desire from the very beginning of time, he was the one that instituted marriage is that there would be one man and one woman for life. That was the plan. That was his desire. In Deuteronomy 17:17, 17, 17, that's reiterated in the law of Moses. In Deuteronomy 17, verse 17 says, Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. These are some principles governing kings. Kings were not supposed to multiply wives. And of course, that was one of Solomon's problems, his wives and concubines. God did not always punish polygamy, though, immediately under the old law. Sometimes he allowed it for certain reasons and for certain times. But Malachi chapter 2 verse 16 says that God hates divorce. Malachi chapter 2 verse 16. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. For it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. In the prior verses, he talks about the wife of your covenant, your covenant wife, and that's how it's to be viewed. So God hates divorce. And Jesus, when he was on earth, taught, as well as the other 
uh, prophets and apostles in the New Testament taught that there was only one reason for divorce and remarriage, and that, of course, was, if you're still in Matthew 19, for fornication. Matthew chapter 19, <clears throat> beginning in verse 7, So they said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. So you see how different the Quran and the Bible are concerning marriage. Both of them cannot be right because they are in great contradiction between the two. And then lastly, one that we have come to see so much in the past 10 or 15 years is violence and war. This is probably the area more than anything where people on TV lie. I know that's a shock for some of you to hear that people on TV lie, but they do and they lie a lot, especially the news media. I think they're the worst. Islam, and I'm just going to read some of the verses from the Quran in a minute. The Quran allows the use of physical violence in promoting Islam, whether it's against unbelievers or against idolaters. <clears throat> from Surah 2, fighting is prescribed upon you and you dislike it, but it is possible that you dislike a thing that is good for you. The other Quran is saying that fighting is good for you. Surah 4, those who believe fight in the cause of Allah, and those who reject faith fight in the cause of evil. So fight ye against the friends of Satan. Their people who do not follow Allah are called friends of Satan. This is from Surah 5. The punishment of those who wage war against Allah and His Messenger and strive with might and main for mischief through the land is execution or crucifixion or the cutting off of hands and feet from opposite sides or exile from the land. Surah 8. Against them make ready your strength to the utmost of your power, including steeds of war, to strike terror into the hearts of the enemies of Allah and your enemies and others besides. Surah 9. But when the forbidden months are past, then fight and slay the pagans wherever you find them, and seize them and beleaguer them and lie in wait for them in every stratagem of war. And of course it goes on and there's many more you could quote. Islam is not a religion of peace. There is nothing peaceful about Islam. Islam is about submission. Islam is about forcing other people, one way or another, to become followers of Allah. Violence and war. That's how so often it's promoted. Now on TV, you would be led to believe that it's a very peaceful uh, religion and that only the very, very, very extreme is uh, Muslims believe in that. But that's, those are quotes directly from the Quran. So that's what the Quran actually teaches. And so no wonder so many are, are uh, out to kill the pagans, the unbelievers, the idolaters. They're called several different things in the Quran. Well, what does Christianity teach? Christianity says, and Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 5 on the, uh, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, he taught this, Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 38. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. That's what Jesus taught. 43 and 44, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray, the, pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you. That does not sound like the Quran. See how different those are? Jesus even told his servants not to fight. Remember when Jesus was on trial, John chapter 18, verse 36? 
He says, <clears throat> I better read it or I'll misquote it. John chapter 18, verse 36. Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Jesus didn't even want Peter cutting off the, the soldier's ear. And that was pretty minor. So Jesus doesn't promote violence and war to make Christians, to subdue the enemy. It's not to be done that way. Rather, the Bible says, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we do have weapons, but not those types. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That's what we're supposed to do right there. We don't use carnal weapons. We don't use bombs. We don't use guns. We don't use terror to try and convert people to Islam. We convert them through the mind using God's word. That's how we do it. But that is not how Islam promotes it at all. Some people have claimed that the God of the Old Testament is just as bad as people of Islam are that blow people up and kill people. Not true. There were times when Jehovah commanded his people to destroy the Canaanites. The reason for that is the Canaanites were totally wicked. They were totally depraved and there was no solution except exterminating them because if they were left they would have influenced God's people taken them away from God in Leviticus chapter 18 Leviticus chapter 18 verses 24 and 25 <clears throat> Leviticus <clears throat> chapter 18 and we'll start in verse 24 says, Do not defile yourself with any of these things, for by all these the nations are defiled, which I am casting out before you. For the land is defiled, therefore I visit the punishment of its iniquity upon it, and the land vomits out of its inhabitants. See what he said? The land vomits out its inhabitants. Why? Because they were defiled. They were corrupt. They were depraved. These are people who offered up their infants as sacrifices. These were the ones who had their infants burned alive as babies. So no wonder these people were so wicked that they had to be dealt with. So there's no comparison whatsoever between what happened during Old Testament times and what happens with Islam's followers today who promote violence and war. I want to finish with a quote by Dave Miller, a gospel preacher, and some of you may know. Islam seeks to bring the entire world into submission to Allah and the Quran, even using jihad, coercion, and force. Christianity seeks to go into all the world and to announce the good news that God loves every individual that Jesus Christ died for all the sins of everyone and that he offers salvation, forgiveness, and reconciliation. The two are so different. Christianity, true Christianity and Islam, they cannot both be divine. They cannot both be inspired. They cannot both be ways to reach heaven. What we've looked at the past, the past seven Sunday evenings describe those vast differences. Islam is not a religion of peace. There is nothing peaceful about it. Islam promotes violence and war through the Quran. 
Islam demeans women and females. Islam demeans marriage. God said one man and one woman. Not so the Quran. On and on we could go. But we've seen without any doubt that Islam is not the religion of God. And we need to understand exactly what it is because the media and, and so many other things in our world try and tell us something that's simply not true. Tonight, I hope these series of lessons have been helpful. The God of the Bible is the only true God, Jehovah. He's the one that we must believe in if we have hope of being in heaven. Tonight, if there's any reason you need to respond to this great invitation, we encourage you to do that as David leads us in this song. Let us stand, please.